Great, good afternoon everybody. My name's Adam White. I'm an Executive Director at CBRE's Manchester office specialising in development consultancy. I get involved a long way upstream advising on large-scale, mixed-use, multi-phase development projects, typically where the public sector, be that a local authority, a transport body, or possibly a university, owns a significant critical mass of land and is seeking private sector skills, enthusiasm, networks, and most importantly, capital to promote that scheme and see regeneration delivered. In this session, we'll be exploring the available routes to market when it comes to disposing of public sector land and buildings, and therein procuring public-private joint venture partnerships and development management arrangements in order to leverage infrastructure investment and make sure that that infrastructure investment delivers wider social, environmental and socio-economic impacts. I'm delighted today to be joined by an esteemed panel. Thank you all for turning up, really appreciate it. Um, I won't ask them to introduce themselves, but quickly to introduce you to them. To my left, we've got Paul Richards, who's the Chief Executive of Stockport Merrill Development Corporation, single-handedly transforming the centre of Stockport with a bit of help from his friends, many of which are here today. A really dedicated team at the MDC and some quite innovative ways of going about bringing forward regeneration in Stockport Town Centre. We've got Roy Barry, adjacent to Paul. Roy is one of the leading, if not the leading, uh, legal advisor when it comes to putting together public and private joint venture partnerships. And he does that in a pragmatic and commercially focused way to make sure that ultimately the schemes that get conceived at the outset ultimately can be funded and delivered. Alongside Roy, we've got Jessica Bowles from Buntwood. Buntwood, in recent times, I think it's fair to say, Jessica, have stolen the limelight around regional investment in science and technology, innovation-led projects. But you're increasingly spending more and more time focusing on town and city centre regeneration initiatives, particularly centred around shopping centre repurposing, revitalising, and bringing back a mixed-use residential-led proposition into our town centres. Andrew Ferguson from LCR, formerly known as London Continental Railways. Some of you may know LCR already, but LCR are the wholly owned development vehicle of the Department for Transport. So very focused on how uh, public land around stations and interchanges can be better utilised and harnessed to deliver in particular large-scale sustainable residential developments. And then on the end, last but not least, we've got Phil Mayle, who's the national... Uh, MD for Muse Developments, who will be known to you all, I'm sure, who have a fantastic pipeline of public-private joint venture partnerships across the country. It's probably fair to say, Phil, at any one time, you're on site with hundreds of millions of pounds of delivery, if not billions. Particularly a good track record, strong track record in partnering with the likes of Network Rail, with Transport for Greater Manchester, with TfL, etc. So Phil's experience in this space is second to none. At its best, Infrastructure-led regeneration has the potential to deliver so much more than just the pipes, the wires, the roads, the rail tracks. And that should make it a national and regional priority. It certainly feels like it's a regional priority, question marks over it being a national priority at the moment. However, regeneration projects are facing increasingly mounting pressures, particularly around the time it takes to secure planning approval, and I think more importantly around viability challenges. Costs have increased, values have taken a turn for the worst, and how can we solve that conundrum between maintaining a focus on quality, but ultimately seeing products delivered, occupied, and invested in? The public-private partnership model, therefore, needs to evolve and move with the times, and that's really what this discussion is now going to centre on. And first, we're going to start off with a private sector perspective, and I'd ask Jessica and in turn Phil to opine on what characteristics of a project that they want to see from the outset that will commit their time, their team's time, their company's resources to seeking out an opportunity, particularly when in the first instance it may not look particularly attractive from a commercial perspective. Jessica. Brilliant, thank you. And, and thank you all for coming in and um, joining in this conversation today. Um, so, and, and thanks for the, the intro, I thought that was um, 
described really well what we do. <laughs> Sometimes it's a bit difficult to describe um, Bromwood because it feels like quite a rangy business. But you you did a you did a great job at um, at uh, narrowing that down. I think you know that question about where do we invest and what um, do we look for. Um, starts with one really big overarching purpose, which we've articulated in different ways through through our um, through our sort of lifespan. But really, it's about um, playing our part in creating towns and cities that are um, really successful over the long term. So we kind of think from a what's the long term play that we can make, and what's the long term contribution we can make to the economies of of the towns and the cities. But when we start looking, you know, because there's millions of things you could do <laughs> within that, that broad um, perspective. But as we start looking um, in more depth, what we're really kind of in seeking out is um, places that have got a plan and places that have got a really long term strategic vision for what they should be doing with their area, what they can be, how they can evolve. Um, and then that they've got the leadership and stability and the leadership strength to see that through and deliver it. So places that chop and change um, in terms of their strategy and their plan or their leadership just, and worse, both, um, are places that are just really difficult to do business. Um, and I think the third sort of thing that we look for um, is a place that's really well connected. So to your point about infrastructure and transport, um, we, we see that as absolutely critical to making the economies of places work, to be really well connected, to be um, a place that people can access um, and that people want to come to. Thanks, Jessica. And th those connections can be hyper-local, <coughs> they can be sub-regional, regional, yeah. national. Is it the whole package? Which, which yeah. of those is most important? Yeah, so. well, it, it, I, I suppose... Um, I suppose all of them are in their different ways. So that sort of national transport infrastructure, and perhaps I'm sort of slightly at risk of getting a bit, you know, into transport infrastructure too quickly, but I did spend quite a few years working in the Department for Transport at the beginning of my career. Um, that national infrastructure is really important for driving up the economy of the country as a whole, for being able to connect cities to cities, being able to kind of have that spine and backbone to the country's economy. Um, when we're looking at specific sites, we want those to be really well connected. And we think there's masses to be done still around brownfield lands in, um, in our regional cities, in our regional towns, and being able to use those places that are already well connected, but we haven't properly um, developed out. And you can see, you know, Stockport are doing a brilliant job of, of capitalising on their hyper-connectedness. Great, thanks. And Phil, your perspectives? What Jessica said. <laughs> um, no, we are. I mean, we're 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 um, we've spoken on panels on this 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 topic before, so we we are very much. You know, we're coming as no shock, very much aligned on this. But there's there's a, there's a piece that or a couple of pieces I just want to drip drill into. I think um, it doesn't matter whether you're running a business, or you're involved in a sports team or whatever. The most successful have a purpose. And I think that's where a partnership starts. So we we work in partnerships that are um, national and multi geographical. So that perfect example, you, you, some of you may well have seen in the press yesterday and, and today, the expansion of our um, English Cities Fund partnership with Legal and General and Homes England, that has a purpose. Everyone's clear in the partnership what the purpose is and we can translate that and communicate that to potential partners so they know what they're getting from us. Um, and then very much this, the kind of second thread of that and the two are interlinked, Jessica said about purpose of the place. So what is it we are helping the place to achieve, not what is it we are taking to do to the place? Because I can tell you if it's the latter, it will fail. Um, it's what, what does the place want to achieve? And then we do, most of the time, have the skill set to, to facilitate and the experience and, dare I say it, notwithstanding the grey hair, the patience to, 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 to deliver on that. And uh, the word leadership is, is, is really, really important um, in that respect. And it's important on, on both sides of the proverbial fence. So far too often you'll hear the, private sector bemoaning in inverted commas the public sector's capacity to respond actually um, 
it takes leadership in the in the private sector to be able to articulate what it is we can and actually more importantly what we can't achieve the other area you quite often see these things fall down on is where um, there's not clarity I'm going to use the word again not clarity of purpose mm. but communicated at the outset mm. so both both partners um, wherever they're coming together whether it's in that national bit or it's in a place bit or a combination of the two are very clear on what they want to do but very clear on what they might not be able to achieve at the moment and um, I'll just close with a, with a conversation and I won't name the place that Adam and I were ju just having sat there around the importance um, of a specific place where we're working where we had a conversation with the leader yesterday and and it's important I, I emphasize the word leader in the council leader sense rather than the leadership sense the two are connected obviously but from a political point of view we cannot do what you want us to do on that site we cannot do it um, and the leader welcomed that conversation rather than saying, yeah, it'll be fine, don't worry. And then down the line say, well, it won't be fine, but it could be if you, if you pay this. Uh, trust falls down then. So sorry, uh, as always, I've given you about eight answers to one question. That's great. I think I've completed Hopefully Phil Mail Bingo. So oh, is that me right? done? <laughs> <laughs> Phil Mail Bingo, yeah. <laughs> no, that was great, Phil. Thank you. Thank and you. thanks, Jessica. Um, so... It, a shining example of everything that Jessica and, and Phil have just talked through is obviously Stockport. Stockport's obviously local to Manchester. Some of you will be aware of what's happening down in Stockport and have your finger right on the pulse. Some of you might have heard a rumour that Stockport's now the place to be. It's now been tagged as the new Berlin. It's one of the coolest little corners of the country. These are headlines in national press features, in national newspapers. And that's been achieved through public sector leadership and public-private partnership. So I'd now ask Paul to give his views on what the public sector has done on its side of that grand bargain. So. I think I'm going to go, Adam. It can't get any better than that, can it? <laughs> uh, and, and just to correct something you said earlier on, uh, just in case any elected members, members of my team, <laughs> or even my family uh, are uh, listening to any of them, I've never done anything single-handedly. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so you know, it's a huge effort by a, a huge number of people. And I, I suppose in, in terms of the public sector, really interesting what Phil and Jessica have said, because it resonates with us as well. Understanding the purpose of the partnership and the definition of people's roles within it is really important. And there's no point promising the earth to, to elected members, because we can't deliver it. So... Look, stop, stop what story is well told, and I, I'm not, I'm not going to uh, spend uh, hours on it this, this afternoon. Um, but what's been really important for us is we, we've got one place, we've got one product, which is you know, Stopport as a borough, uh, and we invest in that. And I think the decision that was taken by others way before me, you know, Eamon Boylan led this charge um, in his time as, as chief exec at Stopport, is put your money where your mouth is. You know, it, it, if you want other people to have confidence in your place, yeah, and, and I'm going to get into master plans already. I was hoping not to, but a master plan's not an achievement. It's a plan. Um, and you know, we see lots gathering dust on shelves. So put your money where your mouth is. Do something. Doesn't matter what you do. Kind of matters a little bit what you do. Uh, but you know, doing something to give the confidence that things will happen and then keep going because momentum in this space and you know thinking about giving confidence to potential partners you know the likes of Phil and, and Jessica um, you know the, the momentum to keep going and deliver it is hugely important and, and you know that's the reason that Stockport is getting some of the well-deserved headlines that, that, that it's currently getting it is because we've been able with a huge range of partners to, to deliver this and you know the the public sector often uh, confuses uh, partnership. You know, profit isn't a dirty word. You know, if you don't pay someone to do something, you're just going to be busy fools. Uh, so, you know, understanding that if you want to get stuff done, bring in that expertise. You have to pay for some of that expertise. Uh, but that is the way to achieve things. Councils can't do everything on their own. And, and you know, too many uh, authorities that, that we see in other places make that mistake. 
Great, thanks. So, so just bringing this back round to infrastructure quickly, Paul. Yep. So you, you've got some hefty bits of rail infrastructure coming in and out of Stockport, yep. haven't you? A scheme that you delivered in partnership with Phil and Muse Developments around the station has transformed that gateway. There's further opportunity around that station, bringing network rail into the mix, for sure. You've had to acquire bus depots. You're going to move the bus depot. You're buying ambulance stations and moving ambulance stations. You know, these, this is the heavy lifting around infrastructure that creates the opportunity for further inward investments. And hopefully that next wave of opportunity will see hundreds, if not thousands, of new homes built in the town centre in the next decade. Yep, and, and, and you know, infrastructure, you know, again, again Stockport has understood from, from early on that it, it does have unrivaled connectivity compared to some other places in uh, in Greater Manchester. But even then, you know, we're, we're ambitious for, for more to come. So we, we had a round table with uh, Lord Hendy and the Mayor just before Christmas to, to talk about the next phase of that, because we, we can't stand still in this space. So, you know, it, it's uh, no secret we have ambition to link up Metrolink across the, the southern bit of the conurbation to improve, you know, we, we don't need improved connectivity into Manchester 12 times an hour, 247 times a day in there in 12, in eight minutes. Um, but we, we do need to link up those other bits by, by things other than roads. So, uh, as Adam says, you know, we've been working closely with, with our friends at, at TFGM to deliver a new electric bus fleet. So uh, Stockport will have one well, of the largest electric bus fleets in the, in the UK. Uh, we are moving a, a bus depot and we've built a new interchange that, that, that opens next month. So yeah, infrastructure is hugely important. And if the public sector can't do that heavy lifting, who can? Great. I, I, I'm going to stop talking to you for the time being, but I'd like you, you prompt a thought that we might revisit in um, Q&A around social infrastructure as well. As you scale up your towns, you need a whole new set of interventions around public realm and social infrastructure that we might come back to shortly. But I want to speak to Andrew now. Andrew, we touched at the start on LCR's unique ownership structure. Um, some people in the room will be aware, others maybe not, that LCR has been instrumental in bringing forward King's Cross. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, yep. globally significant and renowned scheme. Here in Manchester, you're still a shareholder and actively involved in Mayfield. So these are the types of schemes, these generational schemes that are facilitated by your land ownerships, your long-term patience approach your commitment to invest in infrastructure up front. Yep. But I, I thought you might give the audience a bit more context and flavour for what LCR's business model looks like today sure. and where it's heading in the future. Sure, yeah. Thank, thank you, Adam, for the, um, that intro. We, we're still dining out on the King's Cross piece and the deep main <laughs> field, and we have done for some time. And, and to be fair, it, I think it kind of speaks for itself. In my honest opinion, it's, um, the business is around 30 to 35 years old and it's really taken advantage of um, asset land and asset transfer from HS1 um, really very well and in that kind of 30-35 years it's harnessed a skill set in place making, planning, collaboration, um, that overused term which we can probably unpack a bit as we're kind of in the audience here today but once those assets start to dry up then it would become more of a more of a prop co cool mindset where we, we will work with, and, and what chime between Je both Jessica and, and Phil said there is when, when private sector go looking for that purpose, we, we are, we're a bit further left shifted again. We will actually take it nationally. So we've got around 30 to 35 live schemes. So we've got the big ones that we stay in and those take some time, but actually we are commercially driven. We're a public corporation. Um, so we do have our own P&L and balance sheet, but we have a single shareholder who's a department for transport. So what does that mean? So we can act privately, and, but we're still publicly owned, which makes us that unique piece that you brought us to, Adam. But when I talk about that left shift, that's us kind of saying, well, actually, can we derive, can we evolve a purpose for our local authority? Because the regens, a, it's definitely a fad, it's the buzz term at the minute, but actually before we get there, what, what do these guys need in order to get it there? And as, as, we, as we know, quite often they don't have the internal knowledge, skill set, or resource to start to bring these schemes forward. So casting the net that bit wider. So business plan wise, we've got the assets that we have, got about half a billion under management, and we need to have that under management as to maintain public corporation status. So the income pays for our overhead, and then we go out and turn the cash, quite simply. 
The other bit of the bottom line, so we have two bits of the bottom line, is public value, which of course is very important. And being owned by the DFT, the majority of our, our assets and development has to be around transport hubs. So it would be no surprise that we work very closely indeed with um, our sister company, which is Network Rail Group Property. And, and going forward, um, we're having conversations with them about how can we bring even more benefit to society, how can we maximise the benefit of the land holdings of, the, of, the, of PubSec around transport hubs to benefit the taxpayer. So it's essentially we're in that phase of, and the, the viability questions affected, affected us all. I mean, last year we spent, um, as we all do, most of the year trying to get into contract and thinking it's great, had a good Christmas, and this year I spent all, you know, most of the time trying to tell people, don't leave me, <laughs> so, <laughs> stick with it, because it is that longer term view. Um, and we talk about pump priming schemes, just to kind of, of how we do it. So we talked about sitting quite neatly in between public sector, private sector, and, and, the, and the transport sector. We just try and join the dots. Um, between them, and we manage our risk profile accordingly and at the right time we partner with the right people so what usually the private sector or other government bodies to work out where the risk profile ends and then bring them in and then hand over at that point and stay until it needs to be um, and that changes depending on the size and, and shape and and, uh, and scope of the project so when we do speak to a number of local authorities um, and alongside network rail um, we like I say we do help and develop with that purpose if it is already baked, we can acquire land, which is slightly different than the network rail. So we do go out to acquire land to unlock schemes. Gives us some more skin in the game, which helps us stay in that bit longer. Um, so yeah, I think that, that's where we are, have been managing, managing our way in and out of various schemes there and going forward, hopefully working, uh, casting the net wider, grow, growing the business, and like I say, working with close with our, our partnership with network rail. Great, thanks, Andrea. It's fair to say that, you know, mixed-use, multi-phase development is tricky anywhere. But mm. trying to do it against mainline rail infrastructure, yeah. it's pretty, pretty niche and specialist, isn't it? So, I guess you help to bridge that gap as well in understanding as much as anything. That's what it. Yeah, it's the understanding of the railway, and it, really, it's you know, it, it, everything for us has to be passenger first. So, if you kind of work out what the passenger needs to make that journey, you know, succinct and comfortable, then work backwards from that, which is quite often a roundabout kind of way of how us real estate property guys think especially when viability becomes an issue it's always you know what money can we get what can we start off so it's that balance of we understand what the railway needs because network rail and anything around railway station particularly is all about the passenger and the transport secondary if there is some place making we can do to make it better excellent but for them it's passenger first railway first um, so it's like the biggest referee ever <laughs> before you get into the normal planning and all the other all the other ones we have to we have to navigate very good you must have the patience of a saint <laughs> getting there <laughs> <laughs> great okay moving it on conscious of time so it's fair to say that when you put public sector and private sector partnerships together you have to write that into a legal contract you have to go through certain procedures to select your preferred partner and often that's subject to the public contract regulations or uh, utilities regulations. They themselves are going through a state of transition. New Procurement Act kicks in the back end of this year, I think. Um, we said at the outset that Roy spends a lot of time both advising the public sector and increasingly the private sector on finding the right balance, an equitable compromise at the front end of a project with embedded flexibility to ensure that these partnerships can roll with the punches and seize the opportunities as they present themselves over maybe a decade or more. Roy, I'm just wondering uh, how you achieve all of that in <laughs> you know, a shorter time frame as cost and time efficient time frame as possible, whilst making sure that competitive tension is maintained, that the public sector can always demonstrate its achieved value for money, but actually that the private sector isn't just turned off from another Roy or Adam special process. So. Well, thank you. Um, first of all, I think it's, it's quite important if there's anyone who sort of came here for a procurement bashing session, you're going to be sorely disappointed. I do appreciate that it can sometimes get a bad rep, but need to reflect on why it's there. I mean, first and foremost, procurement regs are there to demonstrate value for money for the public purse. And anyone in this room who's a taxpayer should be grateful for that. Uh, on a deeper level, it's also about commercial fairness and a level of transparency that one would expect. And let's not forget, in a world of ever-increasing geopolitical authoritarian threats, 
it's actually quite crucial to a functioning, healthy, liberal democracy, and it's the right sort of interplay between public sector and how the private sector interacts. So I, I'd challenge anyone to disagree that the underlying rationale for why we have it is sound, um, and it can be a very effective tool if wielded in the right way. But like many things in life, and Phil talked about um, purpose, you know, if there's no clear plan or vision, you're, you're, you're sort of on a hiding to nothing. Um, but there are certain um, behaviours that emerge common, and, and we've worked at CBRE before. We, we delivered uh, one particular town centre procurement within 10 months, which I think is some going and hopefully some sort of record. But how do we do it? I mean, it's essentially good old-fashioned teamwork, respect and discipline. But if anyone's going to ask me about the sort of behaviours that you're looking at for formulating an effective public-private sector partnership, it's a couple of trends. So for the contracting authority, well, Phil mentioned already, have a clear vision and list of requirements. Now, even if they turn out to be wrong, it's okay, but just have something and have it with conviction. That's really important. Don't just go into it without any idea about what you want from the private sector. Um, secondly, you need to empower the contracting authority team with the right level of authority. And that's tricky with, with delegated authority, cabinet approvals, but it's more of a cultural thing. And, and my experience of working with CBRE and with Adam actually, is they're very good at facilitating and enabling. Because if you remember that the housing person, the planning person, they'll only do these projects, well, what, once every decade, depending on how long these take to gestate. So they won't have done it before. So they'll have their own experience, but they need help in sort of weaving how they interact with a team. And then own the timetable. That's so important for a contracting authority. And all lawyers want a perfect legal document. Comes a point though, where you need pragmatism as much as I hate it and I want all the commas perfect. You really have to stick to your timetable. And if that means sacrificing a few reasonables and all reasonables, so be it. You, you'll do well from that. Tightly, you shouldn't fix fees, isn't it, Paul? Well, that's it, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then just, just for the aspiring private sector partner that's going into this, I think recognise that the contracting authority team might be a bit out of their comfort zone, let's face it, I mean, you know, and give them help. I appreciate it's a bid and the, the developer is there to win the contract, but it, you know, it, it will give you benefit. That's not just altruism, that, that actually helps. Uh, secondly, acknowledge the contracting authority's requirements, but please don't just reject them. And it's such a simple point, but offer a solution. If you don't like the idea, if it's daft, you can call it out, but offer a solution. And I've sat across the table from the private sector many times where these things have been thrown at us, and it's, what are you going to do? And it's like, well, what do you think? You know, we've given you our idea, it might be daft, but you've got to play it back to us. Uh, and then finally, I think it's really important to challenge the contracting authority if you need to, but be collaborative and fair about it. And I see a lot of the times, and this is why the likes of CBRE do very well in these projects and the lawyers, if you're a developer and you're trying to get things that aren't exactly market norm, but let's say very favourable to the private sector, just recognise that the local authorities' consultants will catch you sooner or later. So don't take the Michael. <laughs> Great. No, I appreciate that, Roy. So we've procured our public-private partnership, hopefully through CBRE and Brabner's LLP, although other advisors are available. Um, lots of promises are made on the quality side of uh, a procurement process, but it, it struck me as really stark recently. The National Audit Office concluded recently that DLUC has not consistently evaluated its past interventions to stimulate local economies, so it doesn't know whether billions of pounds of public money has had the impact that was intended. Now, I see in strong public-private partnerships that purpose, that vision, that mission being set. I also see strategic goals and smart objectives embedded into the business plans, maybe not the legal agreements, but the business plans, so that these things can be measured and benchmarked in a transparent manner through time. And I'll just take it back to Jessica first and then Phil, because I know this is in the DNA of your business now. We've talked about purpose, Jessica, but you have a purpose framework at Brumwood, don't you? And you might want to expand on what that means to your business and the partners that you work with. Yeah. Um, thanks. And uh, look, I think what we've, you know, what we've seen over the last 5, 10, 15 years is a, is a much deeper interest in how do you extract value in a, in a way that works for the wider community that works for all of the partners, that is, that is um, gener 
genuinely sustainable, by which I mean long term and transformational. And I, th I think that's, um, you know, that has been a shift that you can see much more attention on that. Um, and, you know, <coughs> Phil and Muse and, and, and you described it around LCR, you know, we're all looking for how do we do, how do, we do that? Um, you know, Bruntwood for, throughout its history has wanted, has seen that sort of, um, the success of our cities as being the thing that will drive our success. So it's worth putting back into those. It's worth thinking about the whole place in a very strategic way. Um, and we, but we weren't very good at measuring it and we weren't very good at describing it apart from with a thousand stories. So we did create something that tried to pull together um, what we were doing around the environment, around um, social value, around um, uh, the um, culture that we wanted to see within cities and that we wanted to contribute to. And we did it in a very Bruntwood way, which was to take what is our purpose and then, and then make it really real and tangible, both for the business, but also for our partners, um, so that we can, we can demonstrate through the day-to-day -day action that we take how we're contributing to the environment, how we're contributing to social value, how we're contributing to the culture and the long-term sustainability of a, of a town or city. It's not very easy to do, and I think that sometimes we get a bit um, hung up on measurement and turning each measurement into a pounds value. And I, I don't think um, I don't think it necessarily gives you the right answer. And I think that the whole you know ESG social value world is probably on a journey here, um, and it will change and develop over over time because the translation of you know jobs and apprentices and local employment into pounds in social value terms, I think just it leaves me feeling a little bit queasy. And the reason it leaves me feeling a bit queasy is because I used to work in transport and sorry for transport planners and modelers in the room, but quite often you would look under the bonnet of the transport model and the numbers that went into it and you'd think you'd got a really good thing, but actually you realized it was all a bit smoke and mirrors or the data wasn't very good inside it. So I think there is a point about needing to measure it. I, I don't think we've quite got the tools and I don't think we've quite got the approach right because you sort of know it when you see it where you've got good value out of something that you've delivered and where you've got sustainable transformational change. Um, the numbers need to catch up with it, I think. <laughs> Phil, your perspective? Yeah. I think there's um, we could do we could do a day on this, not yeah. not not just a question. Um, I think there's 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 three things I'd I'd kind of r really focus on, um, and, and the first two are connected. I think for an existing business, I think it is very difficult to articulate a value that or isn't already isn't in your DNA. So an existing business saying the suddenly mm. pl plucking a value, the two will be divorced and it will be very, very difficult to get from there to there. So very much like, like Jessica, it's always felt like we've done it and it always felt like the right thing to do. We just didn't measure it. I mean, let, let's be honest, we didn't use the term social value five years ago, six years ago. It's only just coming into play. So, and I'm in, in exactly the same place. I, one, I don't trust the measurement that has to be converted into pound shillings and pence because you can't see it. But that's the point, you can't see it. I guess the difficulty is, is that things do need to be shown to be of benefit. So how we get there, I think, will need to be an on, ongoing debate. For me, I'm very, very simple and I, I, well, I have a very, very simple full stop. <laughs> but very, very, I have a very simple view on it in that if it feels like we're doing the right thing, we probably usually are. <laughs> uh, we can do better yep. and we can challenge ourselves to do better. I think the, 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 the first thing, um, or the first two things I'd say, so the value and the, and the measurement were in exactly the same place. I think we are relatively unique businesses I think in in the world of business not just real estate the world of business if you think of businesses and I, and I waffle on about this quite often so forgive me if you heard it before but in the world of business even service industry manufacturing you have raw material you have process you have customer I, even in service industries that that's how it works we're pretty unique in that we have customers at both ends so that isn't so that for for a house builder that would be land, the raw material would be land. That's not the point really. The people we're working with, Paul, 
right, back. Uh, the you know, people, people in the in, in the local authorities and the partners we're working with. Yes, of course, the pounds that are generated, the actual pounds in this instance that are generated for land, very important. Don't get me wrong, but we're there to deliver so much more. As a, a they're our customer. Before we even get to the people who live, play, work in the spaces we create and the places, we've got to deliver something here, or the business will pretty pretty quickly run out of steam and I, I think that it can be quite complicated because the two sometimes aren't aligned but actually I think it's quite a, a special business to work in when you can you can have an impact at both ends of those those chains. Thanks Phil I think the thing for me witnessing it from both sides of the public private um, perspective is is the need for hyper local responses whether they're measured or not. And the public sector has a big role to play in that because they're the ear to the ground, they're the mouthpiece mm -hmm. of those local communities. And I know that's really important in Stockport. It, it, it is, Adam. And again, just picking on Becca's point about measurement, you know, me measurement is important at certain stages. You know, it's important mm -hmm. so we can compare like with like and, and ensure that we're getting our pound of flesh, to be perfectly honest. Um, but it's important to, to ensure that something is delivered against. But the bit in the middle, there's a bit more flex in that. And you know, you know what good feels like. I think there's, there's some, it sounds like I'm slamming local authorities sat here, but um, there is something about partners being better, local authority partners being better, in identifying what do you actually mean by social value? Mm -hmm. What would you like to see delivered in this space? I'm doing quite a lot of work at the moment based on the fact we've got a few hundred million of construction on site at the moment to, to ensure that you know that there are a range of options um, that, that you can deliver social value through but the pie is only so big what, what's important and you know a constant uh, gripe we have particularly from contractors is well tell us what you want you know we, we don't really care what we deliver slightly unfair maybe uh, but you know tell us what you want and that you know it is <coughs> excuse me uh, the burden on local authority to ensure that we deliver the right social value and, 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 and as Adam says when we uh, did the, the stop or eight procurement with Adam hyper locals mm. really important we, you know, we, we live in a borough where uh, the levels of deprivation half a mile from the town centre are significantly higher than they might be three miles from the town centre and they're the people that are, I was going to say pissed off then but I uh, I caught myself just in time. Uh, they were going to get pissed off by the fact that you've got two years of construction right next door to them. So, and it needs to be smarter social value. It's not just how many CSCS cards can yeah. you can you get yeah. delivered. Mm. What's the point in that? Let's do some stuff that actually is effective. Agreed. I think I'm being given the death stare. <laughs> <laughs> I think to conclude, and it's a great place to finish, you know, in my experience around what makes public-private partnerships succeed, it's that strong vision, it's that purpose. When we go to market to procure a private sector partner for the likes of Stockport or LCR or others, increasingly I'd say 40% of the criteria and the weighted scoring is on ESG. Hmm. Price is 30 or less. So the people that can master that space will be the perfect private sector partners for the next 10 and 20 years, I'd predict. And that's the route to success. That's the route to achieving more bang for our buck, our public money. When it gets invested up front into land assembly, into infrastructure investment, into pump priming opportunities, it's looking at things more holistically than perhaps a traditional commercial surveyor might do. No time for questions, if we have any. Any questions from the room quickly? Just at the back, Martin. Well, I guess there are two aspects to that, Paul, aren't there? There's political upheaval, short-term general election cycles, all that side of things. Stockport's an interesting example of how you can overcome you know, a, a political division through the MDC. Then there's the financial one. Um, 
Can you tackle them well, both? I'll, I'll, st- <laughs> I'll start, and you know, perhaps it's for Jessica and Phil to, to demonstrate what they think good leadership might, might look like. But there's something about, yes, consistency. Uh, Stockport is a no overall control authority. It's flip-flop from Lib Dem to Labour and, and back again uh, over the course of the last 10 years. Uh, but what we do have is all our groups aligned to region not being a political, political battleground. You know, th- there's obviously bits of the borough that different groups would like to see developed in different ways. But again, we're, we're quite fortunate. It's about understanding uh, your USP. Stockport is a, is a borough where its town centre is a huge uh, economic centre of gravity compared to anything else around it. And therefore, investing in that as an authority it isn't a political bum fight. So uh, ensuring you've got that political leadership aligned, and again, you know, the work of others way before me uh, to get political leaders in that place, uh, but then to, to keep them in that, that place. I think the other thing is, you know, and I would say this, wouldn't I, but, uh, you know, strong uh, exec leadership as well within the authority that, you know, what, what I hopefully do, and, and Phil would definitely have a view on this, is I, I bring my planning and highways colleagues along with me, uh, and they're equally as aligned to, to the message of delivery, delivery regeneration, delivery regeneration on Brownfield, and let's make things happen, because it's way more exciting to do stuff than not do stuff. <laughs> and on the financial side, Paul, without getting into too much detail, it's, it's fair to say that you're, you're under the same pressures that lots of local authorities are. A few years back, you set aside 100 million but specifically focused on in borough and particularly town centre investment. So you at least didn't spread all of these bets around the country and you know, started buying property and lending against property elsewhere. So in that sense, you, you can still plough ahead through this downturn. I, I think it's about choices, Adam. And I'm looking at Andrew McIntosh, he's heard me say this a load of times. Uh, you know, authorities have a choice as to, as to what they spend their money on. And, you know, Stockport has chosen one way. It's, it's chosen that Regen is it, its top priority. Others haven't chosen that, but you can't complain about it after the fact if you're not prepared to put some skin in the game. Um, so I, I think that's another message to take away to the local authorities. Times are hard. You know, 114 notices are flying around like confetti at the moment. Mm. Um, but there'll still be a way. And, you know, we, we, we've had the benefit of significant, significant capital funding from central government there's lots of authorities, and again, Adam made the point before about the, uh, the, the DLUC figures. Lots of authorities sat on lots of capital. What are you doing with it? Private sector perspective, Phil. Very I'm sure you can help them spend it. So. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> um, very, 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 very quickly. I just want to take everyone back. I don't think anyone really picked up on it. Um, something Paul said right at the beginning where he said... Um, We've got one borough and we invest in it. Mm-hmm. Pretty simple, so it might just, you know, go, that is what we look for. Not that they're, mm-hmm. in, you know, not, not that oh, we're spending money, but the simplicity of what they want to achieve was in a sentence. And we worked, you know, we worked with Stockport for, for over 10 years, so I, I, I know that they were that as well. It isn't just a, a tagline, but that. So, number one, we know exactly what um, that the, the, the borough needs. And it doesn't really matter to us that it flips from, control to no overall control from party to party because we know that somebody's that there's been a lot of work on consistency of leadership so we, we know that if we've got a new leader next week that the new leader will have his or her own slant on what the borough should achieve and of course they should do or else they're not a leader but we know that they're not going to go nah and an investment in anything i'm um, things like hs2 you need some clarity yeah, i said it um, oh goodness, and on that bombshell, <laughs> <laughs> but the, just, we're going to stop, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> but that, just, just that, that that clarity of purpose, um, consistency, and I would I would say that we've got the constraints that the public sector have got in that we don't have enough people to deliver up and down the country. We talk to more authorities than we can actually service. So without those two things, we will go somewhere else. I know that sounds really kind of blunt, but get your act together and, and we can work, you know, you work for a long time and they're the best relationships. Great. Panel members, thank you for your time. Thanks, I think thank we're going to have to wrap it up there. Hopefully you can stay around. The next discussion is going to be around affordable housing and how we can have more of it sooner. So, Thanks, everybody.
I'm going to introduce myself again because I can't remember who was here and who wasn't. Um, apologies. Uh, my name's Adam White. I'm an executive director based in CBRE's Manchester office, specialising in development advisory work. So I often get involved in large, complex schemes and increasingly those that are residential-led and delivering hundreds, if not thousands, of units, at least if we can find the money uh, and the viable routes to market to achieve that. Interestingly, and particularly for this debate, I also uh, sit on the board and chair the board of Manchester City Council's uh, housing delivery vehicle known as This City. So I've got a vested interest, a personal interest that goes beyond you know, my profession and earning fees and all those types of things in making sure that affordable housing is delivered at pace and to a high quality, both in the city of Manchester, but beyond as well. So I'm very interested to hear what the panel has to say about all of this, because I might bring it into our next board meeting. Oh, oh yeah, it's a four today, yeah. <laughs> Emergency <laughs> meeting at four, what a day. Um, bringing housing under the national infrastructure brief I think is really important. I see the reason this is on the agenda today is because I see affordable housing as being as important as HS2, as important extensions, as important as bus reform in our devolved cities, if not more important. But at the moment, it's still not talked about in that way. And I want to elevate that conversation and make sure that affordable housing is seen as nationally and regionally critical. It feels like we're getting there regionally, for sure, but we need some help from the national government as well. It also can hang on the back of huge amounts of public investment into infrastructure projects. And some of the examples that we'll talk about shortly, I think, you can have all of those societal, economic benefits and create the business case and the return on capital employed to pump prime the infrastructure that's needed to facilitate the delivery 30,000 homes across GM. You know, so it, it's one and the same conversation. I'm going to introduce the panel guests briefly and then we'll get into the Q&A. So Andrew McIntosh, thanks for joining. Andrew is uh, Places Director at GMCA sits on a fair amount of grants and loan money around affordable housing, so he's a good friend to have when it comes to trying to bridge that viability <laughs> gap. <laughs> More later. <laughs> <laughs> You'll notice Becca has sat next to Andrew. Yeah. Becca is um, Head of Strategic Development at Manchester City Council. Amongst a plethora of things that you have to spend your time on, affordable housing is increasingly important because it's so important to the members and their constituents, Becca, isn't it? So I'm sure you'll talk about how you're bringing forward affordable housing in the borough. Jackie from Homes England, everyone's other best friend as well as the CA <laughs> when it comes to delivering affordable housing. Jackie, you were recently promoted from uh, head of affordable housing and you now have a wider remit around place which I'm guessing takes in infrastructure it takes in working with your combined authority and devolved partners as well as having a focus on affordable homes delivery and then Alistair Chapman my colleague uh, and co-lead of our development advisory business in the north is here to give the private sector perspective and also Alistair sits as an non-executive director on the board of Stockport Homes, a registered provider as well, so we can bring that dimension to the debate. I'm going to stop talking in a second, but just to put the size of the challenge into context, so some numbers, around 340,000 new homes, that sound about right, are needed per year in England, of which 145,000 per year should be affordable. However, we're only achieving about 50,000 affordable homes a year on average between 1991 and 2022. So that's a huge period of time where we've underperformed as a nation. Last year, about 60,000 had completed and that was up and similar to pre-pandemic levels, but that gap is massive. So I guess one of the first questions that I'm interested in is affordability is quite a flexible term and it can mean different things to different people at different times for different reasons. So I thought we might just get each panel member's perspective on what affordability truly means to them and what they're seeking to achieve, uh, starting with Jackie. 
Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, so, yeah, Homes England is the government's national housing and regeneration agency, is, is the government's delivery agent. So we're responsible for delivering uh, the £7.4 billion pounds worth of uh, affordable homes grant programme uh, money at the moment. Uh, so within that, there are, there are kind of different products in there, both rental and routes to home ownership. So affordability in those terms uh, means kind of affordable rent, uh, kind of anything, um, kind of at least 20% of market rent. You've got social rent that's more around 50% of market rents. Uh, and then, like I say, you've got uh, shared ownership and rent to buy products as well, trying to get people into home ownership. What I would say is, within those national programme parameters that, that very clearly define what affordability means in terms of what we can support and fund, uh, we, try to, we try to respond to market conditions, we try to have some flexibility. So in my old role, which was uh, Head of Affordable Housing Strategy and working on the current Affordable Housing 21 to 26 programme, uh, we, we kind of worked really closely with government to try and get additional flexibility around where we could apply those social rent grant levels, which are, which are higher than normal affordable rent levels. Um, and you'll have seen, kind of, if you, if you follow the Affordable Homes Programme quite closely, um, there's been significant changes over the last 18 months that means that we can deliver much more social rent homes than we previously had in the programme. Um, and we've also got something else that was in my kind of previous role. Uh, we've got our strategic partnership model with a range of housing associations as well. So again, working on that portfolio basis with housing associations, meaning that we can help them to flex their financial envelope as much as possible, means that we try and do what we can within those defined policy parameters of what affordability is. Fantastic, Jackie. And, and Becca, I'm sure there's lots of alignment with that, but Manchester City Council has a slightly different definition of affordability and has introduced a new concept around the Manchester living rent. So. Yeah, so, um, you know, absolutely uh, recognise some of the uh, products and support that Jackie talked about there and, and social housing, shared ownership. Uh, rent by all really important but for us we've recently uh, introduced the concept of Manchester living rent which is essentially rents that are at or below the local housing allowance levels because I think increasingly we're seeing demand well, demand is really strong for housing across the city. We've seen huge inflation in rents and purchase prices and in, in particularly high demand areas even uh, something that's 80% of market value is still unattainable for lots of people. So, so yeah, so the concept of the Manchester living rent is, as I say, you know, local housing allowance level and below. So if you're in receipt of housing benefit, your rental costs will be covered. And we're looking to introduce that through, and you've touched on this already, this city, our... Um, our arm's length housing delivery vehicle so uh, we've made a commitment that at least 20% of the homes delivered through that will be Manchester living rent or below and that's subsidised by uh, the rest of the, the housing that's at market rent. We're also working with RPs, many of their, their homes are, are offered at um, Manchester living rent levels or below but we'd like to see more of that and then obviously trying to encourage more affordable provision from developers. Great, thanks, Becca. And, and probably the third perspective, Alistair, is that of the RP, the registered provider. And, mm. you know, without betraying too much of what happens around Stockport Homes board table, the challenges that RPs are facing at the moment mm. make, you know, their delivery of their purpose that bit more difficult. You might explain some of those challenges. Yeah, it's absolutely huge. So just so people are aware in the house, social housing sector, the, the Social Housing Act, which has come in recently, completely changes social housing in this country. Um, a lot of it is to do with you know, the damp and mould case that happened in, in Rochdale with the, the poor boy who, who died, but it's fundamentally changing the way that housing associations look after their estates. And so the tenant satisfaction measures which now come in are going to be rigorously enforced by the housing ombudsman. And, and the shift it's creating in housing associations in terms of the, what they are prioritising is unbelievable. They're allocating their whole teams towards actually making sure they achieve tenant satisfaction measures. Because if they do not, Michael Gove has already started to create mergers, compositions, changing of, of leadership roles as well. The sector is going to be regulated a completely different way going forward. And what does that mean? Well, it means that a lot of associations are going back to core business which is looking after an existing estate, existing tenants. And what's falling away? Well, it's the new building programs. And particularly when you look at, well, where's the money coming from? A lot of that has been borrowed on bonds, low yields, great, but those bond periods are coming up for renewal. They're gonna renew at a much higher rate. That's become more difficult. The Homes England programs are fantastic, but 
it's not going to bridge all of the gap. So you're left in this very difficult position where actually core business is co coming inwards, housing associates looking merging, and they're not looking outward in terms of actually how to deliver these homes. So we're in a really difficult position where the, the economy's gone to a difficult position, bill costs have gone up even more to a point where it's actually hard to build these homes as well. Grant is, is, is not covering the gap. And so a really, really difficult position of, well, how are we going to deliver this? Because at the same time, need has gone up. So it was with a, a deputy chief exec in Greater Manchester yesterday. They have 500 families in temporary accommodation. You say temporary accommodation, what does that mean? It means a and b which they check in on a Monday and have to leave on a Friday, and they don't know where they're going to be. And you say most of those families have been there for two years. It's not temporary. So that need is, is going up day and day. So you know, the, the sector has got a huge issue to face, and, and that's why I'm so glad we've put it on the agenda today as the infrastructure, because it absolutely is. Great. Thanks, Alistair. Um, Jackie, you, you touched on strategic partnerships with RPs, yep. and there's millions of pounds to deploy through that channel, but you're also in a pilot strategic place partnership with GMCA. Um, I'd very much welcome Andrew's thoughts, your thoughts as to what that means, how is it going, lessons learned, etc. as far as you can, because it's, it's relatively fledgling, isn't it? So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll look to Andrew's prompt on that. <laughs> yeah, look, I think officially sort of entered into the partnership in June 22. I think the reality is that we've been working on uh, in partnership for 12 months plus before that. So it kind of feels like we've been working collaboratively for uh, a long period of time. I think in terms of, you know, it, it is a success. It enables us to sort of look at a single plan to jointly invest uh, our joint fundings in, into projects so that we've got alignment across the different funding sources. Uh, and I think that's actually critical to unlocking and enabling schemes to come forward. I think it enables us collectively to support project development. Uh, you know, the, the delivery of housing, uh, it's certainly new, new housing, new affordable housing is a, a long-term plan that you need to put in place and, and enact and implement. And actually that needs support at the front end to ensure that you're delivering the right quality of places uh, through the delivery of the affordable housing, which is you know a part of what is, in most cases, a broader part of the picture. So actually, through the partnership, being able to align our objectives and actually to align funding, both from a revenue and capital investment point of view, has, has been really critical. But I mean, even after, you know, nearly two years, I think, you know, there's still a lot to go with, with slowly aligning uh, more and more in the way in which we operate. I think there's there's just so much demand out there that even collectively we struggle from a resource and capacity point of view to do what we want. So I think there's more to be learned. But I think from my perspective, certainly a, a good start in terms of decision making, being aligned and that from a from a starting point is a is a great success which sort of wasn't achieved before the partnership was in place. Great, thank you, Andrew. Let's turn Andrew's microphone off and get Jackie's perspective. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so for us um, at Homes England, we're real advocates of the strategic place partnership model, uh, and it's been going really well. Obviously, GMCA, as you said, was our first one and reflects the kind of maturity of the combined authority and our ability to work with them. But then we are looking at how we roll out that framework across other mayoral combined authority footprints as well. For all those reasons that Andrew's just said, and it reflects on what the previous panel was saying as well, by having that framework that you signed up to, by being really clear about accountability, priorities, how you're going to align funding, it, it means that you, you're addressing some of those um, some of those things that could be knocked by kind of not having that long-term buy-in, that long-term leadership, that long-term vision. It gives everybody something to coalesce around, around both kind of public sector and private sector. Uh, so for us, and you'll see it kind of in the devolution framework that was published by government, it makes explicit reference to Homes England establishing strategic place partnerships with mayoral combined authorities to build on the success that we've had with Great Manchester. Great, it's really exciting and, and quite innovative in trailblazing, isn't it, in the GM sense. Becca, I know you've got probably a local authority perspective as part of the GM fa uh, family, but also, you know, selfishly, what's in Manchester's best interests? So. Yeah, of course. But I mean, I think for us, obviously, that's it. Uh, Andrew said it, there isn't enough resource to meet all the demand that's out there, but that greater certainty about the level of funding. So 
150 million over three years and a promise of a further settlement in terms of brownfield land funding for example does give us a much better sense of 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 you know what's coming down the tracks and enables us to prepare for that but as well as as the capital investment there's also uh you know some revenue funding that that the ca and homes england can help deploy with local authorities to enable the pipeline to be developed and that's really important i think you know it it's really hard as a local authority or you know as an RP to, to sort of be there, you know, kind of bidding for funding rounds as they're coming forward. That certainty allows you to work up schemes, get them to the point of deliverability, so when the money comes, you can press the button. So I think it has been really helpful. And then obviously there's a commitment across Greater Manchester to deliver 7,000 new homes with the initial 150 million. What we're trying to do collectively, under the guidance of Andrew, is make sure that we, we don't just deliver those outputs within programme timescales, but we can demonstrate that by investing in local priorities, uh, aligned to sort of, you know, strategic priorities across GM, we can deliver more with that money and over time we'll make the case for further flexibilities. And you touched on this in, as well in terms of, you know, the affordable housing programme. So brownfield land funding, <laughs> revenue funding to, to develop schemes is really important. But, you know, that ability to influence the affordable homes programme is really key. And I think one of the, the most welcome developments last year as well was the use of AHP for reprovision as well because in Manchester you know we've got major redevelopment plans for Collyhurst which will require reprovision of of not no longer fit for purpose council homes mm -hmm. and without the ability to leave in that kind of grant it was really you know an uphill struggle and I think we've we've now sort of uh, that will be enormously helpful to meet that priority yeah just Sort of following on from Baker's point, just to, you know, we're in the places hub, you know, it's complicated to bring these schemes forward, especially when we're talking about delivery at scale. So, you know, Beck and the local authorities are curators of places. I'm a facilitator. You know, all I'm really doing is ensuring that, you know, the people that effectively are the constituent parts of the combined authority are able to deliver on their own ambitions at a local level. And our role really to facilitate the development and delivery of that, working with Homes England as another partner, and equally working with RP partners so that actually we can demonstrate that we've got a plan and a working arrangement within which they can also operate and, and bring forward development. Because I think Alistair's, you know, is obviously in the midst of it in the board discussions, but from my perspective, you know, we're, we're demanding higher quality through building safety. You know, we're expecting everyone to suddenly address all the damp, damp and mould issues. We're expecting them to help and and uh, deliver against our net zero targets and the existing stock, and then they've got to build new houses as well. So actually, the complexity of the whole system uh, and the way in which place is important to that, and the fact that everyone's got to come together in a collaborative approach to ensure that we actually deliver the objectives and the point I made in the last session around longevity of being able to plan for that. It's not easy and a sort of short term cycle that keeps on changing an ever changing set of rules is actually really difficult to deal with when you've got a complex system that you're trying to navigate. And I guess that's where Places for Everyone comes in. Places for Everyone is in effect the spatial framework for almost all of Greater Manchester. Um, Approved recently, secured? On the way. On the so way. So it's been through consultation. So the yeah. inspector's report has been issued yeah. with some proposed main modifications. Okay. And now it's going through the, uh, the approval cycle. And affordable council. housing is part of that, but employment use. And bringing this back to the, the, the raison d'etre of the conference, infrastructure. Infrastructure is yeah. covered, list of priority projects at the GM scale and maybe at the local scale. How do you, what, what do you see are the big infrastructure plays that will ultimately facilitate the delivery of these 30,000 homes? So I think the infrastructure challenge is so huge, I wouldn't sort of pick up on any individual projects per se, but I would point out that actually there's a local infrastructure requirement and then there's a more uh, national infrastructure requirement in the sense of... Uh, 
departmental expenditure that's going to be needed in things like roads through national highways and what PFE provides as a plan as to what we need to bring forward and what we're collectively working through is okay well what sequence do we actually need to deliver the infrastructure to enable the growth that we're actually trying to achieve and use that sort of consistent uh, and, and well thought through plan and PFE to then engage with developers, government departments around the timing of when the investment needs to go in so that actually we can accelerate growth in a GM context. And I think you know affordable housing is a critical part of the growth that we want to see in a GM context. So, you know, people and I may have said this earlier, but everyone comes at it from a sort of siloed perspective of, you know, market housing, affordable housing infrastructure. And the reality is that, you know, we are in the plan bringing forward large mixed use developments that require infrastructure, affordable housing market for sale for rent, commercial <coughs> property, all in a single place. So actually it's not, and everyone needs to move away from this sort of siloed approach, but how do we get government departments to think in that way and engage with us on the basis that look, we, we brought the partners to collaborate uh, at the table and to, to make their own investments, and that includes private investors, and, and we'll be looking to government to make their own investment into that as well. Becca, any Manchester perspectives? Yeah, I mean, I think Andrew's absolutely right. You know, and actually, uh, Andrew and I worked together many years ago, sort of making the case for devolution. Uh, you know, God, it was back in 2014 or whatever <laughs> now. Uh, and actually, you know, <coughs> 10, 12, 15 years ago, the point was that, you know, growth and regeneration takes a place-based approach. You don't have long-term funding settlements. I do appreciate that spending review periods mitigate against that to some extent. Uh, and it's really hard to align funding from different departments. And I think the single settlement that's coming forward now is a step forward on that. I've already touched on the certainty, the relatively short term, but still some certainty around brownfield land funding. But for me, the example that I would always use in terms of some of the challenges about the fragmented approach is Victoria North. So beyond Victoria Station, up through um, uh, to, to Collyhurst, We've got a long-term 15, 20-year partnership there delivering 15,000 homes, so a significant contribution to the housing requirement uh, set out in places for everyone. But obviously, if you're creating that many homes, you need the supporting infrastructure, so that's social infrastructure like schools um, and health facilities, for example. You need the local facilities, the community facilities, and then you need the transport infrastructure. So we're, we're making the case, again, with Homes England support and CA support for, for a new Metrolink stop at Sandhills to, to support that neighbourhood. And it's just really challenging. I mean, that kind of development is really challenging anyway. We've had 51.6 million uh, of, of um, housing infrastructure investment funding to remediate the site because it's so contaminated and at risk of flooding. But being able to take that long-term view and bring DfE and the Department of Health and the Department of Transport and a range of partners together to sort of collectively look at the challenge would be enormously helpful. It's not there yet. We are taking some small but positive steps, I think. But you can't bring forward a new... It's almost like a new town within yeah. the city without the infrastructure there to ser service the community that you're developing. Great. Thanks, Becca. I'm conscious of time. I think we've got five, ten more minutes. Yeah. Um, the perspective we've not had yet is that of the private sector investor, Alistair. So what we've heard is that affordable housing is really difficult. The public sector is doing more than its fair share. I get the sense that the private sector and the investor community is starting to wake up to affordable housing as an opportunity that it maybe wouldn't have looked at even two or three years ago. You just give us... Yeah, thoughts absolutely. On yeah, thanks. I mean, it, it, it's, it's interesting because I've, I've set out quite a dark picture when I spoke last. <laughs> um, but the, the dark picture does create a really interesting space. Um, and and you know, CBRE tra you know, track all the transactions in, in the sector. So in the quarter four last year, there was a billion pounds worth of investment in affordable housing. You know, no one really talks about it. Um, mainly in one deal. So Blackstone funded um, a purchase from Vistry, the, ha the housing builder, um, and they effectively bought 3,000 homes from Vistry, half for private rental, half for affordable housing. In the same month, M&G 
bought £50 million worth of assets as well. Uh, and PIC, Pension Investment Corporation, made their first investment as well in the UK, another £65 million. And, and what was interesting about the way that these organisations are turning on, and we heard this in the last, um, in the last session, is it's, it's about social impact. So these are investors allocating social impact funds within all of our pensions. You, know, you can tick a box, 2.5% goes into the social impact space, and your level of return might be 3 or 4%, but it's over a 25-year period. And that's the money that's coming into this sector. And although, although obviously the public sector is doing a huge amount, that is, is going to retrench overall because the need is so much bigger. But there is a vast array of capital. So CBRE Global Investors, for example, has a, a fund called the UK Affordable Housing Fund. They've spent 125 million. That's the first allocation. They've got another 250 million. M&G have got another 500 million to allocate. The Greater Manchester Pension Fund of CBRE now look after have got 840 million. Not all for affordable housing, but to a large part to, towards that sector if it creates social aims. And so the whole piece, I think, has, has just changed enormously. And the way they're deploying it, I think, is fascinating. So they're actually landing it via um, not-for-profit RPs. So there are developers setting up in the UK who are an RP, who aren't a traditional RP, and they don't have the baggage that I see of, of all the uh, stock that needs repair and the carbon upgrade and, and the like. They are looking at new build solutions with a not-for-profit CV backed by a social impact fund. And actually, you could see the market splintering. You could see the RP market looking after core, dated stock, trying to manage that. And you could see the private sector starting to build at pace, at, you know, high quality, low carbon product that meets their social criteria. So I think there's a real watershed moment and actually in, in this darkness that we've got in the sector, which is really, really hard, maybe, maybe there is something here which will really start to change the, uh, the market, I think, as the private sector comes in. Yeah, fascinating. Thanks, Alistair. There was a really interesting deal just announced yesterday, actually, again, coming back to infrastructure network rail and their block. Uh, housing delivery JV have just signed um, terms with Citra Living. So Citra Living is the built-to-rent um, funding arm of Lloyds Bank. They're going to hopefully deliver 2,000 units across network rails, existing land ownerships, adjacent to transport infrastructure, so very sustainable. And a good slug of that will be affordable rent or home ownership products as well. So this is gathering pace and momentum all the time now. I'm sure Andrew Ferguson's having a look at it from an LCR perspective as well. I'm conscious of time. You are probably pulling as the public sector most, if not all, of the immediately available levers that you have at your disposal. I just wanted to recap on whether or not there's appetite, Jackie, for Homes England to invest in infrastructure and or start to be more interventionist through land assembly and CPO and all those types of um, indirect tools that might ultimately deliver more affordable housing more quickly. Yeah. So as Homes England, I mean, we've got a whole range of, uh, we've got our statutory powers, as you've just yeah. alluded to there. We've got a whole range of tools. We've got expertise. We've got a, quite a vast workforce uh, of where we can get in and support places. I think what it comes back to is uh, some of what Andrew was saying earlier in the previous panel. That need for us all to take a place-based approach actually means that we can do far more with what we've got available. And rather than kind of working in the typical silos that we've been working in before and kind of even, and this is part of my new role, taking the agency from being a, an agency that is responsible to, for delivering program targets and outputs actually to having more of a place-based approach. So how do we bring everything together and how does that enable us to do more with what we've got available and then using frameworks like the strategic place partnership framework that we've got that we've talked about before actually then how do we align resources across beyond what homes england's got how do we resource align, align resources across partners as well um, making sure that actually we're getting in early we're doing that kind of first kind of 20 percent can we take the risk as homes england can we start to build some market confidence and then can we crowd in and help to make markets Thanks, Jackie. And you, you touched on this in your morning session. He's been up twice, so we are in <laughs> a nice lunch. Um, about taking equity positions. So obviously, Homes England is a shareholder in English Cities Fund. You just announced a doubling of the size and capacity of English Cities Fund. Andrew, you touched on this morning about public-private partnerships, the need to take equity positions when necessary. Your thoughts from the CA level, and then Becca, the housing delivery vehicle that is this city, is the best example I can think of. So maybe Andrew and then on to, to Becca. Yeah, no, look, <coughs> I think it's about being more innovative in the way in which the public sector influences what's coming forward. And I think it's using the range of tools that 
Jackie was talking about and I think when Jonathan opened up this morning uh, the mayor said it already in terms of you know looking at the way in which we capture, val uh, capture value out of land the way in which we actually start to explore CPO models so that we can actually assemble the necessary land not that it's gets applied everywhere it's where we've got a strategic objective and partners aren't coming together to work collectively that we've, at least we've got the tools that that enable us to sort of overcome uh, difficult landowners where there's a there's a public good to do so but i think actually the public sector putting some equity in so that they can sit at the table and work collaboratively with the private sector to bring forward the development we want is going to be critical moving forward and working with jackie's colleagues to extract as much of their home building fund through an equity product as we possibly can uh, over the course of the next couple of years which for me is you know uh, it is really important because it, it is bridging the gap of what possibly the private sector is not particularly willing to put into the market you know we need to be and uh, you know paul said it in the previous panel in terms of stockport if we don't believe in you know the the regeneration of our areas why are we possibly expecting the private sector to do so so we've got to be in a position of you know putting our money where our mouth is in regard of back in places and, and the regeneration plans that we've got perfect segue into this city we touched on it a couple of times becca but yeah. uh you know what drove officers to recommend to members and members to choose to take direct delivery and ownership risk so, well, I think it's part of a broader uh, consideration of all the levers available to us. So I would also say that we have just completed Silk Street, a scheme of 69 social rent properties in Newton Heath. So that's the first direct delivery we've done for a while. So looking at uh, the potential for, for direct delivery of social rented homes in Collyhurst, I touched on that earlier. Uh, we're working with RPs and new entrants to the market. We're looking at our land supply and how we can bring forward, you know, appropriate sites at appropriate times to enable delivery. But it was actually, it came more as a challenge actually from politicians back to officers, which is how can we increase the, the supply of affordable housing, genuinely affordable housing, and also make it net zero. So that was quite a hard challenge a few years ago when the question was first posed. It's really difficult at the moment in, in the current climate. But again, it is about, you know, looking at our, our lands, looking and putting that in as, a, as an investment, uh, working with partners to, to sort of uh, over a pipeline of sites to be able to deliver that supply. And, I, you know, we're still working through, as you will know, and you'll hear more about this afternoon at four o'clock, we're still working through some of the options around that because it's not easy, but we'll be going out to market soon for, uh, for an investment partner to help really start to, to increase the supply of new homes brought forward in that way. 1,500 new homes, thereabouts? Yeah. Well, the ambition is for yeah. 500 a year. Yeah. 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 So uh, watch this space on this city. Shameless plug from Becca and I. Um, please do contact either of us around that opportunity. <laughs> um, I think we're being asked to wrap up now. Uh, time for one or two questions, if there are any. Jonathan? Jo uh, Jonathan Mosley at CBRE. Um, there's a proven link I believe, between improving people's access to social and affordable housing and savings to the state in terms of the NHS and social care and the criminal justice system. I think there have been various statistics, but one that I recall said for every pound you invest into social and affordable housing, housing you might get three to five pounds back. Do you think that's sufficiently well recognised and talked about and factored into the case for investment? No. <laughs> that's GMCA's perspective uh, <laughs> um, no I don't think it is but it is something that we consider so for example you know I've already touched on how challenging viability is on sort of some of the initial this city schemes at the moment but actually if we can you know get people off our waiting list get people out of temporary accommodation you know if you, if you can get people in good quality homes it reduces the burden on other council services and I think you know I'm really fortunate actually sort of you know we've got a uh, very experienced uh, you know financial uh, 
a financial team that can appreciate the wider benefits of some of that investment because we know, you know, and Alistair touched on some of this, there, there are huge pressures across the housing stock generally. We're, as a city, seeing such demand, but you need to start looking at the wider benefits mm -hmm. of some of that. Uh, so as a council, we do, but I agree with Andrew's firm. Um, no, I, I, I guess I, that's I, regional <laughs> devolution in, in its purest sense, isn't it? But is it quite happening like that, Andrew? So. Yeah, I mean, to elaborate, I mean, Beck and the local authorities are doing a great job at recognising that benefit, but the reality is the NHS budgets are still flowing down from a central department, and actually what you do is you remove someone who's in a bed in the hospital and they go straight back in there. So the fact that there is a perceived and I think quite justified benefit that's achieved is not recognised at a central level so we kind of again back to we're doing what we can at a local level uh, but actually it's how do we get the recognition at the central level to, to start supporting us in, in the endeavours to, to reap the benefits of what we're doing and I think the spatial plan just from a in a, in a sort of more medium term planning sense you know, it's not just about any house, it's about the right tenure mix. You know, how do we deliver supported housing? How do we deliver the right full housing in the right places so that actually we can create step up, step down type accommodation beside the hospitals, you know, North Manchester, General Withenshaw, so that actually we're doing as much as we can to minimise the burden in the wider public purse. But I think the, my flat knows because it's just not recognised. So there is no cash flowing down. So we can all talk about the great benefits and we can all, for our own decision making purposes, take that into account and we do do and we will do but that doesn't seem to flow down from a central government department perspective into hard cash that enables us to accelerate delivery because they don't see the link I don't think between a place based approach and you know the budget decisions that they make centrally. Just one more question uh, from... I'll try and keep it quick. Um, Colin Black from, from Mayor Brown. There's been a lot of talk about the importance of infrastructure and place based strategies and when delivering affordable homes, obviously the kind of the infrastructure requirements for people living in the affordable homes will be very, very different to, to those people who perhaps might be living in some of the surrounding developments. And there is a mixture of accessibility requirements necessary. Whereas our transport assessment process and requirement for developing transport strategy tends to be rather clunky. Um, it often misses the mark. So we often see affordable developments provided without the necessary infrastructure to allow people to live um, uh, full lives with access to employment, education that they would need um, in those properties. Now it's a bit different in city centre environments but on the edge of cities and uh, perhaps in more rural locations it's, it's a really big issue. What what would you like to see done differently as we move forward and how can we improve and there's been no kind of real scrutiny of transport assessment guidelines and um, requirements for quite some time. How can we improve that? So we're not just talking about how we deliver them in financially, but also how we make them work effectively as uh, great places to live. Um, yeah, so I think the, this is where the devolution deal actually does have a real benefit from a GM context. So unfortunately not an national answer to this, but you know we've got a devolved budget <coughs> for transport, which will enable us to make different transport decisions. I think we're always going to be constrained by the amount and quantum of transport funding that comes into GM, and we'll always need to service and, and, and pay for a lot of the existing services. So the pot for enabling growth is small, but actually devolution means that we can take those right decisions. You know, mixed tenure type developments, it's all about accessibility. We're all about the inclusive growth opportunity. So how do we connect those deprived areas in a GM context to the economic growth opportunities that exist and will come forward under the, the uh, spatial plan in a GM context? And that's at the forefront and will be at the forefront of our decision making process as we actually allocate uh, funding towards new transport projects that are really focused on enabling growth. Becca, any perspectives, Jackie? No, I mean, just to, to, generational living to echo, echo Andrew's point, you know, again, we do come back to the fact that there's, there will never be enough resource to do everything that we need to do, but that's where, you know, we're a TFGM, a refreshing transport 2040 at the moment, um, precisely to, to ensure that it remains fully aligned to the growth objectives that we've got for Greater Manchester set out in places for everyone. And, 
you know so it's about maximizing and making best use of the funding available to deliver the infrastructure transport in this case required great thanks everyone i think i heard the lunch bell go about half an hour ago so <laughs> thanks for bearing with us i'd like to thank the panel members again thank you for your time and that draws to an end our second slots so we're back up at what time <laughs> half an hour ish i think an hour plenty of time for lunch <laughs> thank you everyone